Hey everyone, Benji and Igor here at the Contractor Evolution Studio. So as your business grows in size and in complexity, one thing that tends to happen is that individual team members begin to work in their own silos. Interdepartmental collaboration gets harder and harder to do. Interpersonal relationships suffer. Think about it, if one arm of your business doesn't know what the other is doing, all sorts of problems can and will crop up. In fact, you may already be experiencing this. Now, one of the quickest fixes that you can implement is something that we call a team huddle. What this is, it's a regularly recurring meeting that gets everybody on the same page as far as results, and it allows your team to celebrate wins together and sets your week, your month, your quarter up for operational success. So in today's episode, we share a really easy to follow six-step process plus four best practices that will dramatically improve your team huddles or help you start them for the first time. So let's dive into the world of team huddles. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Okay, so Igor, what exactly is a team huddle? Let's start there. So a team huddle is a very unique opportunity that you have as a leader in business to have your entire team together on a pretty rhythmical basis. So we'll talk about rhythms in a little bit. There's no rule around the rhythm, but what is I think fundamentally important in business as a leader is that you do have a mechanism where your team, they know that they're getting together on a regular basis. You know when it is and how it's structured and that you can apply a bit of a formula and really good preparation to this rhythmical team meeting. Now, one kind of important point I want to illustrate, and Matt, our video producer, I remember a couple of weeks ago said uh, he likes the sort of like life examples. Um, if you think about it, us as humans, we're meant to do stuff together, right? Right. That that is like a hallmark trait of a human being. It's compared we're evolved to, to do that. We're we're literally biologically evolved to do that. You're meant to do stuff together. Contracting, I find, is really cool because it's such a team sport. Mm, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you you're not like a solo programmer or surgeon or sometimes engineers or whatever, right? Like it is truly a team sport. Like go look at a construction site. Super so, into it's interdependent. Everyone relies on each other. Interdependent, both on site but also just an entire orchestration of the whole shebang is pretty cool, right? And I think when we're in this world of construction, contracting, you're almost not aware of it, but when you really zoom out, when someone looks at the nature of a contracting business, it's such a team sport and you have to, as a leader, embrace that team aspect to it and make sure that your team builds those relationships and has that kind of deep trust and close personal working relationship together where they where they uh, have a great dynamic right. amongst each other. So that's really what it what a team huddle is. And it's absolutely your responsibility as a leader to foster great team connection and great rhythmical team huddles. So I get it. But here's the thing that comes up a lot. I've had this conversation many, many times with contractors and business owners. They're like, these, like, these meetings suck. Mm-hmm. Okay, and there's a few there's a few common reasons I thought of that I hear a lot. So one of them is, um, yeah, we we do a we do like this weekly sort of team meeting, but it lacks structure or mm-hmm. direction altogether. It's like this meandering sort of pointless, long winded thing where people leave being like, "What was that about?" That's one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, another one is they can turn negative super super quickly. Mm-hmm. Some people call them a bitch and moan fest. Like that's the colloquial term for these meetings. You have, you know, a crusty old project manager who wants to complain about all the subs Mm -hmm. on site. You have a sales guy that wants to, Mm -hmm. you know, totally bitch about the quality of the leads. And then everyone else piles on and 20 minutes into this meeting, it's just like, you know, it's like pitchforks and and fire. People are like choked. Like that's, and that's a scary place to be. Yeah. You've like, you've you've lost it. You've lost control. So that's that, that, uh, these, these meetings are, uh, you know, susceptible to that happening. Um, another one I hear is they can be 
quite confusing or overly technical. You'll get somebody on the mm-hmm. mic, whether it's the business <laughs> owner or someone else. And they just that, go off. Yeah, they go off on a rabbit hole that's like su- obviously super important to them and they clearly have a lot to say about it. But it's like, man, this is not actually relevant for the whole team to hear about. Mm-hmm. And and actually, like, they don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, so you're, happens you're, all con- the time. you're confusing people, okay? So that's another one. Uh, they can be extremely boring or repetitive. I hear that a lot. Um, sometimes they'll lack a strong facilitator which means mm-hmm. like people are uh, nobody's keeping time nobody is like following through an agenda mm-hmm. um no if if somebody goes off on one of those rabbit holes i was i was saying nobody like cuts them off and brings them back to the central point so that happens a lot and the last piece that i think is really important is when all of these things happen you got to think about the optics for the people on your team you say you have 20 people in your company you're all together you spent an hour times 20 everyone's going Look at how much team time we just used up. Do you have any idea what's on my plate, everyone else's plate? What a waste this was. And people can leave these meetings less motivated than they were when they went into them. Totally. I get that. That's all totally true. And and you're not wrong and they're not wrong. But here's the thing. It's still super, super important from a perspective of like you have to have your team together. They are a team, right? You, it's not enough to have departmental meetings uh, and individual one-on-ones and all this kind of stuff, which is important. But, and I hear everything you're saying, but you have to have some sort of mechanism where you as a leader bring the entire cohesive group together. Right. And, uh, and, and all of this stuff that you say in here, like at the end of the day, there are strategies and tactics and we'll get into a whole bunch of them here, uh, in this conversation around like what you do to mitigate these, because you're totally right. Like they do happen all the time. Um, the issue really is like all of them stem down to, is the problem with the leader Mm -hmm. really. Right. So if, if you're listening to this and you're saying, well, either we don't do them or one or a bunch of these things, we do them poorly, we do them poorly. These things you just mentioned are happening. It's because of you. Well, if somebody's not, su- okay, that's true. But if somebody is listening to this and they're just like not super bought into the whole process, get, like mm-hmm. what are the couple reasons why you absolutely have to do them? Yeah. It's, and it's and, a- and what, what's the risk of not also? Totally. So ultimately, like the, the way that I, I like to think about it is um, th- there's all these departments and people are really in their silos, right? When you think of like a marketing right. and sales silo, the estimating side, the production side, the office side, it's so easy for people to get into that, their own world. Mm-hmm. Like I am an estimator and I pump out estimates. I open the week, I close the week, I open the week, I close the week. Same thing with, with production. Like we're just getting it done job after job after job. The office people are just doing the same repetitive stuff. And they really don't understand how everyone, how I fit into the big picture. Right. And how everyone actually works together. How your work in the marketing stuff affects the volume of qualified leads that are coming in and what the estimators can do. As the estimator, then, you know, they need to be able to understand how their work mm-hmm. impacts production. The production people need to understand how their work impacts the office and the end customer, right? right? Like at the, I mean, if you think about it, everyone's at the end of the day working so that the office staff can, can get everything done and closed out properly. But you have to, you know, without a team huddle, people, it, don't understand how they fit in to the grander picture, right? There's a larger organism, which is the business. You've got people that sit on various different parts of it. And without Mm -hmm. this team huddle where you come together and reflect and share results and do the things we're going to talk about in a second, it can feel like these people are just, they're floating. Yeah. And just like showing up for work, clocking in, clocking out. That's it. They don't, they don't get the larger picture. They fit within. Yeah. That's the first part. Second part is they'll also lack meaning in their work, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't bring them cohesively together, they don't understand their part within the team. Right. Right. And they may understand because they see the people or you may have told them and here's the org structure and I've drawn it out for you and whatever, but they don't feel it. And those are two different things, right? Totally. Like to feel the meaning in what you do as a part of the grander picture is very different than being told that you're a part of this team, right? So that, that th- those are two. And then the third one just generally is kind of touching back on what I said earlier, like you are operating a team sport. You're, you're the coach of the team, yeah. right? You are like the principal of the, like the formula one team, if you will, that has the drivers and the mechanics and the engineers and the tacticians and the pit crew and like all this kind of stuff. Right. And there's a team principal and that team's principal or in your job's case, the leader of the team is to bring those people 
together, right. right? When you think about like, what is in your job description? There's a couple really big items, but certainly one of those really high at the top is to bring cohesiveness to the team. You must do that. It's just like how you must ensure the company makes money and is financially viable. Right up there with that one is this point of like, it is your job to bring cohesiveness to the team. And unless you're focused on doing that job, which includes like orchestrating good team huddles and a few other things, you're not, you're not succeeding in your role. Right. And you might not feel it because you're a business owner and no one's maybe not holding, people maybe aren't like evaluating you and holding you accountable. But if you had a coach and someone was, they'd be like, look, man, you're not doing your job on this part. Right. 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 Because with, with without having this, like a bunch of not so good stuff can happen, right? Like you have people operating in their silos, right? And they're gonna that's just gonna keep going and going, and you might not feel this sort of short term ramifications of that. But over time, your estimator estimators are gonna really end up in their own world if they don't truly understand the production engine. Right. If they don't truly understand like the like the world of the office people. Yeah, right. if the if the you said an estimator, if the estimator doesn't get the feedback that the estimates they're crunching the numbers on are actually way off, and the production team is doesn't have an opportunity to get that feedback back to estimation, that just that just continues to deteriorate. When things are left alone, they tend to get worse. They tend to get worse, right? And it's the same on the second one that I want to bring up here. The second big issue with not doing them is the death of the culture, mm. right? We're unfortunately living in a world. You and I talk about this all the time, right? We're living in a world where distance, more and more distance is put between people with technology and more independent lifestyles and distance, people working moving from out home, of, working from home, yep. all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's again, one of these things that isn't like immediately noticeable, right? You're like, well, we save money on office space and travel and team events and things like that. But it is dying a slow death and it is really, really going to hurt you and hurt the team. Big picture. You just don't see it right away. On, on, on this month's or this quarter's financials, you know, to be literal, but it is absolutely, you're kidding yourself if you think it's not hurting you. Yeah, it's like, a, term. like, an, like an iceberg that disconnects from the shelf. It, you yeah. can barely tell it's floating away first, but eventually like, oh my God, that's, that's gone now. Totally. And you're, and, and you're, you're saying your culture it's is kind of like though. that. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's like glacial. Like it, you, totally. you, this month, maybe not, but two years from now, all of a sudden nobody yeah. knows each other. Yeah. And if you don't do your job as a leader to bring that cohesion to the team, it will melt away slowly. Okay. So right. we're clear. Can on, I say one other sure. point? Uh, is this level of team collaboration won't be fostered because they haven't built the personal relationships amongst each other. Right. So when you talk about the example of the estimator not getting the feedback loop for production, it's the same thing from the office. They're not going to get the feedback loop on where things are at patterns. If we have certain patterns on AR with certain customers, certain profiles of customers or types mm -hmm. of jobs, the estimators aren't going to know that. Or anyways, I'm just throwing out an example, but it's this concept of like, you're not going to have healthy team collaboration. The result is more stuff on you. Right. 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 And I've seen the effect where everything goes through me. Like I'm the linchpin, right? It's like phone calls, texts, emails, everything through me. I think a lot of people can relate to that. Exactly. As opposed to when they've built these really healthy working relationships, because you've done your job as a leader to build that kind of culture, they're going to begin leaning a lot more on one another. And not on you. And not on you. Okay. So, so we're, okay. That's, that's what a team huddle is. That's why it's important. And that is the risk of not doing one very well. I think we're clear on that. Mm -hmm. What we've put together, kind of put some thought into this. We've got a six step process to follow mm -hmm. and then four keys that are going to make your huddles better. So we'll start with the six steps and then we'll get into the four right. best me, practices after. Perfect. Let me kick off the first one here because this one is so pivotal. And when you look at this list of issues that come up and you're totally right, they do, they do for 80% of, 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 of companies that, that we see out there. It's because they don't do this first point. And that first point is to prepare a well thought through agenda as compared to doing it off the cuff, right? Uh, having other stuff get in the way when you were supposed to prepare your agenda and you, and you weren't disciplined enough to stick to your block schedule and do it, or you just roll into it intentionally with it off the top of your head. Off the top of your head is not an agenda. That's not an agenda. You need to write it down. Exactly, right? So at the very, very least, it can be on a, well, on a piece of paper. Um, ideally, it's a bit more thought through than that, right? Where you've actually really taking the time to, to distill like the key topics within the meeting, 
in this subtopic. There's a start, there's an end, there's a middle, like there's a sequence to there's this. Structure. There's structure. That's premeditated. Yeah. Okay. And it's premeditated. And, and the key is, is that there are these recurring parts to the meeting, right? So it's certainly, we're going to talk about this. You don't want to have it boring because the, the topics are going to change all the time, but you absolutely have categories of things that stay the same every single week or month. week, month, quarter. We're going to talk about the cadence. My big recommendation, and, and I'll throw it out here right away, is the cadence doesn't matter as compared to the quality, right? Um, just speaking to Team Huddles overall, one of the, the big places where I got inspired on these is watching, so Brian's, the O2E Brands and Brian Scudamore, yeah. the founder of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, they do this incredible job with, and they do daily team huddles. Now, they're a very, very robust organization. 1-800-GOT-JUNK is the largest junk hauling company in the world. Huge franchise system. They have a couple other brands as well, but they do this incredible job at, at planning and structuring these daily team huddles. Now, they have a ton of resources. My recommendation is really like you should be doing this then less often if you don't have as much time and focus, but you still make it great. The point is you've thought through these agendas mm -hmm. and your main structural items can stay the same, right. right? It's like like in basketball game, you've got a first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, you've got the halftime. Just because that's the case doesn't mean the game is the same or boring every time. Right. The game's different, but you've still got those segments to it. And we're going to talk about what some of those segments are in, in totally. some of these later steps. Okay, point number two. Point number two, use slides. Yes. Okay. Uh, some people are visual learners. Some people are auditory. Uh, it helps to have a visual anchor point that people can look at that says, okay, this is what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. It's way easier to follow along. Um, and it keeps the conversation anchored to that agenda that you've built. So when you're doing this, oh. while you create the agenda, all you do is just translate that into some slides. Mm -hmm right? Big font, few words on each, maybe some bullet points. It doesn't need to be crazy fancy, but that makes a huge difference. And you know why? Because your team sees you've gone through the effort to build them in the first place. Exactly. Okay. You know what? Igor spent the 10 minutes it took to put some slides together. I guess I better listen because this clearly isn't totally off the cuff. You're, it's, it's proof of work. You're like, hey, look, I did this. Totally. It's not, it's not just like a random sort of yeah. meeting we're going to get together and bullshit. This. We, totally. So that's a very easy way to visually express that to the team and keep them anchored, keep them following the agenda that you built. Exactly. Let me just add one important point there. Uh, you talk about that people, like one of the biggest issues, like what we hear a lot is people aren't engaged. It's just one of these things they have to do on the Monday morning or whenever your, you know, whenever your team huddles are. Um, if you want it and you need it to be important to them, it best be important to you. Totally. Which means that you've taken the focus time to prepare for it, to think through it, the content inside of it, the structure, the timing, and put some slides together. Because mm -hmm. if clearly it shows that it doesn't matter enough to you that you put it together well, it sure as hell is not going to matter to them. 100%. And it's your fault. 100%. Okay. Point number three, start with some wins. Yes. Big and small, personal and business. This keeps the tone really fun, really light, and it provides a little insight into what is going on into the lives of some team members that may not be able to talk that much. And listen, uh, think about your staff's world. What did they deal with all freaking week, all month? Problems. Right. Right? This has come up in production. We're behind on this plan. There's an issue with sales here. This estimate's off. We've got AR bubbling up over here. They they deal with a lot of issues. And this is your chance to start them off on a positive, happy note. Totally. It just keeps it light. It's like it's sort of like the same ideas. When you go to an estimate with a customer, you build rapport with them. You get to know them on a personal level. You keep it fun. So a um, couple things like, we I, like, you know, our team, uh, there's a lot of really outdoorsy people to give you some example of some personal wins. People are doing like the coolest trips all the time. Really cool four day camping trip that someone just got back from. Oh, you just finished a hunt. Like what happened? Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Show us some pictures. Um, we have a lot of young parents on our team and you know, a few times a year, a kid is born. That's a win that we want to hear about. It's super and celebrate. It's a hundred percent. That's so, so, so exciting. Good for you. Let's see some photos. Like that kind of energy is a really, really nice place to start the meeting from. Mm -hmm. And again, shed some light into the personal lives of the people that are on your team. So those are some personal examples. And then the business wins is also just as important. Hey, 
man, our new estimator that we hired last year, he just had his biggest quarter ever. That's huge. Hey, tell us about what you did, what led to that success, shine the spotlight on him or her, make him feel really valued. Or, hey, you know what? We just finished a project a few days early. That was huge. We got this customer review online. That's huge. Like get that stuff up in front of your team. It's a really, really easy culture builder. 110%, right? They, again, they're going to go into all sorts of challenges in their week. Um, like in, in our case, we do team huddles first thing Monday morning. That's, that's how everyone's week kicks off. Um, and we just started with, 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 with good fun. Our, just rolling with this example here, our intercompany communications inside of Slack, mm. uh, you strategically structure the Slack channels. We have one that's just called hashtag success and it's just all about wins and good times. Right. And that's where the, the kind of the key content for every team huddles opening section, the wins is it w where where it comes from right that's a so, capture all we go there take a screen grab throw it on some slides and say look at this cool thing that happened yes that and the rest of the team has free reign to put stuff in there right just cool stuff that they've accomplished in work or or outside but you got to start positive you got to start fun and and uh and trust me it is a like a self-fulfilling prophecy if you're highlighting success displaying success putting success on a pedestal, it will drive itself mm -hmm. over time, mm -hmm. right? And that is an absolute opposite mindset to negativity. And these are the challenges and these are the problems and all this kind of stuff. Like we got to start with good, fun, successful stuff. 100%. Cool. Um, next point I want to get to. So that was the third one. Start with wins. Uh, number four, uh, performance dashboard update. Mm. What are the numbers? Right. People want to know that um, if you've done your hiring job properly, you've hired people who want to win and they want to succeed. They care about the results. Championship teams care about the score. They care about the score. Exactly. If you're a great athlete, you care about the score because right. you want to win. Um, it's your job as a leader to show the organization where you're at as in actual results against the plan for the company. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Don't sugarcoat it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Don't sugarcoat it. You know me. I'm pretty real. Here's what's going well, guys. And here's where we're absolutely behind. Yeah. Right? And here, and it's just, it's frank. It's real. Um, this one, I know for some companies, can be a little bit more complex because the underlying piece to this is you got a, a decent level of reporting. That's true. Right? So if you don't have... Uh, systems for tracking, CRM, all this kind of stuff, it's going to be a bit more difficult. But um, the results that you're showing are going to be totally business dependent. But the ones that are that are and should be public are, are, are pretty straightforward, right? Like where are we at from a marketing perspective and how many leads we're generating? Where are we at in the number of estimates we're completing mm -hmm. and the quotes that are going out the door? How many jobs are being locked in? What's the performance, like the conversion ratios for the company as a whole and different estimators? Yeah. Where are we out on the production side? Like how many labor hours are we producing or how are the subs doing? Where are we at on our production schedule? And then you might have other financial metrics like AR and, and the time aging of certain accounts receivables. And are we, are we making up gaps on AR? Maybe you share revenue, maybe you don't, right? But you know, you got to figure it out for yourself, but you really should have a key dashboard of what we, we call our performance dashboard where the key metrics of the business are there. Right. And they're, and they're on display. I love it. That That is a proven, there's so many books about this. This is a proven best practice of high performing organizations is it, like where are we at is front and center on a performance dashboard. The truth is a beautiful thing. It is. Don't avoid it. Just tell it to your team like it is and go from there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's, that's the fourth one. Uh, have results front and center performance dashboard. Very clear. Um, fifth one here, uh, bulletin board section. So think of this as like a, a team wide, um, kind of section of to do's, right. Uh, and it's a chance to be able to tell the team about what's coming up and what the team needs to take action on. So if you're in, like working on your business and implementing a lot of stuff, there might be new marketing initiatives that are starting. That would be cool to have the team aware of. You might have new truck wraps coming out right. that certain teams need to be aware of. You might be giving them a heads up of, hey, we're going into a new technology or, or a CRM system implementation next quarter or next month, we're going to be introducing a new job clocking system. There's a massive sa a safety training coming There's down the pipe. There's a safety pipe. training coming yeah. up. Exactly. Yeah. So you want to really, th this is your chance to think through like what is coming down the pipe, the way that 
I run these things is I actually have, so in addition to the, so think about, we got a folder of team huddle slide decks, right? This is now in Google Drive. Uh, with, and the whole team has access to all this, by the way, right? So it's all in there. The performance dashboard is in there mm-hmm. where they can just, anyone can go see it. And then I have a calendar that isn't public to everybody, but it's literally a calendar. In our case, it's in, it's in Asana, that project management software, but we've got a calendar for the team huddle bulletin board items, right? And key topics that are being discussed. So I know four months from now that we might be implementing something. So let's say in a contracting business, we are, we're implementing company cam. Mm-hmm. Let's say where we're going to actually track with photos, everything in the estimates and in production and all this, like we're, we're going to implement this super important and powerful tool. And I know when it's coming, I right away put it in there when I want to begin to bring it up with the team. Right. Right. So I've got a calendar of that kind of stuff. And then the month after that, we're doing new team uniforms. Everyone, can you get your sizes into this person by, you know, two weeks from now? Exactly. It's, it's we're updating our website. We got new team bios that we want up and updated and on LinkedIn or Hey, uh, on our Instagram page, we're going to create an awesome highlight reel of right. all of our staff. Right. And, uh, and Hey, we're going to have this person from our marketing agency going to be connecting with each one of you this week to write up a little bio yeah. that we're going to put up on Instagram or wh- whatever. Right. Like you can, all these things that come into your head really should go into this, into this calendar schedule so that you know, to get it into those slides. And that, and that team huddle. Love it. Okay, so that's so, point number five. So that's point number five. The sixth one I want to close on is, is and guys, this is such a key point, is just chill good time. Every week, every month, whatever the cadence of your, of your huddle is, but when the content of it is done, give them free time. How much? At least, it depends on the cadence. I'd say if it's weekly, give them 10 or 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. If it's monthly, give them an hour. Right to just hang out. And ideally these team huddles are done in person, in which case it's amazing. People just hang out in person, go grab a coffee, a tea, whatever you want. You want to stay in the office. You want to go for a walk. doesn't matter, but just give them time to hang out. Right. Right. And if it's, if it's digital, like our team, unfortunately is, is, is spread across a bunch of offices in different cities and things like that. Um, it can, it can still be done digitally like on zoom, but it's like a coffee break and hangout time where there's, you know, if we know, like in our case, we know that the team huddle lasts about 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, but it's blocked for an hour every week so that people just have time to hang out. Again, if you're like on a more of like a monthly schedule, then then you should have more time, but have that space in the calendar dedicated in just for people to hang out. Again, it's one of these things that you might be asking like short term, like, well, why are we spending so much time right. on this? This is like 30 people times 15 minutes every week. Like, look, I, I've done the math. I'm a numbers guy. I get, I get the, the cost implication of this stuff. My message to you is like, you're going to burn that money and you should burn that labor, mo- that payroll money. Uh, make it good. Right. And have people connect. Again, it'll pay back in dividends long term because you have a cohesive team that loves working together okay so, so that is the six step process we've covered it process. now we have four i'm just gonna do a quick recap, recap and then we'll exactly. and then we'll get into and then we'll get into these these sort of key yeah. insights so number one prepare an agenda and in your head it does not count number two use slides they don't need to be super fancy but put a little effort in it's going to show your team how much you care and it's going to keep the whole thing linear number three start with some wins big and small personal and business Keeps the tone light. Uh, Number four, create a performance dashboard update and give them the good, the bad, and the ugly every single huddle. Number five, there's a bulletin board section. This is your opportunity to get across to the whole team all the things they need to know about. You don't want to send them all individual texts. Can you imagine how long that would take? So just use that bulletin board effectively to broadcast messages company-wide. Number six, the one that Igor just ended on, is a coffee break at the end for your team to hang out. Amazing. Okay. Really good. Let's get into some best practices, Benji. So we've got a few pointers here. Um, these are just... <clears throat> some observations. Number one, share the mic around the team when appropriate. Like nobody wants to hear one voice just droning on and on and on. It's boring for the listener and it's a lot of work for the leader. If it's totally. you prepping every word every single time, um, 
that that's just cumbersome and it's way easier and more dynamic, more colorful to just kind of, hey, you know what? Let's go to sales for a second. I'm not going to talk about the sales update. Let's hear from the sales manager. Let's hear from the sales guys or girls, whatever. Exactly. That's that's the way to do this. And the expectation is that you you have the expectation on them to prep this stuff. Totally. Right? So you're not just they know randomly. What's coming. They know it's coming, yeah. right? And you've you've when you're starting it for the first time, you have them thoroughly prep for it. They can make the slides that they want themselves, hold them to a high standard at the beginning. But yeah, you're right. Like it, it's not all on you. The one voice is boring and it's a lot on you. The way that we do it is we do it by department, right? So like marketing needs to speak to their marketing stuff and their updates. Sales in the contracting case and estimating, it's all in their production, office team, all that kind of stuff. Everyone speaks to their own updates. At the same time, be strategic who you give the microphone to. They should be a good, coherent speaker. Be positive, happy. What sort of values and tone do you want them to be broadcasting? Pick the people wisely. That's a good point. Awesome. Uh, Next kind of piece of best practice, second one here, establish a cyclical rhythm. What's important is that it's at the same sort of cadence, whether it's a daily cadence, so it's at the same time. If it's a weekly cadence, it's at the same day and time of week. If it's a monthly cadence, there's an established ritual. What it shouldn't be is random. And here's the... What's that? Well, I just was going to say, like, if some weeks it's this time and other weeks no, it's no, no, this no, no, day no, no. and bad, sometimes bad, bad. we don't do it at all and sometimes it's 30 minutes and Ooh. sometimes it's an hour. <laughs> That's the killer. That some weeks good. I'm busy, I'm canceling it, I've got a lot on my plate. That is a formula for disaster. It's the same week. It's religiously at the same time. Totally. Right? Every day, every week, every month, every quarter, if you need it to be once a quarter, if you're that busy, we're just getting going. That's fine. The big thing I would really recommend is air on the side of higher quality, lower frequency. Right. Right. So don't run out of lis- run out of your truck after listening to this episode as you're cruising around and be like, we're implementing daily team models. They're going to be shitty. <laughs> <laughs> Promise you. Yeah. Right. Less frequent, higher quality. You can always turn up the frequency. Do not start with low quality. Right. right. So again, I was using the example of O2E brands in Brian Scudamore. You just Google O2E brands or 1-800-GOT-JUNK team huddle or put it into YouTube. You'll see how awesome it is. They've got whole videos about it, whole companies there, hundreds of them. They have the production capacity to make those things great. Chances are you might not. And it's just nothing yet. And there's nothing wrong with doing it like on a monthly basis, even a quarterly. I know really great business leaders and executives that that execute these kick-ass huddles on a monthly basis. And that's amazing. Totally That's more than fine. That's absolutely fantastic. So keep the quality high. Uh, Don't worry so much about how often at the beginning, but you must have it on a cyclical rhythm. That's the second best practice. Okay. Number three, and this is such a big one. Don't be afraid to cut off ramblers and don't be able to stop people. Don't be afraid to stop people from going down those technical rabbit holes. I do that holes. all the time. You, Yeah, you, you were the king of this. You just like nip it right in the bud. It happens uh, not infrequently. And this is what a good sort of cut off could sound like, hey, Tim, Sarah, this sounds like a super important conversation. And I definitely want you guys to have it. This team huddle is not the environment to do that. So why don't You've you got take 30 this, people listening. why don't you take this offline? Why don't totally. you guys schedule a call outside of this? But this conversation that you're having right now in the context of this meeting is done. Let's totally. get back to the agenda. And and you know what actually what is interesting is if you're good at structuring and facilitating these team huddles, you will have that. That's almost like a sign that things are going well because people are gonna begin getting into things, right? It's very normal and it's actually very healthy. You'll start to see it. If you're doing a good job, this will happen. Tim and Sarah will get into this like right. complex discussion. So it's not a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You just, as a leader, you have to be, hey, Tim, Sarah, really good points. It's an amazing conversation. It's super important. Let's do, do it We have 30 elsewhere. people here. Let's yeah. do it. Can you guys either stay on after huddle or send each other a message in, in Slack or Microsoft Teams or whatever you're using and talk about it after. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's best practice number three. Uh, number four, and this is the last one, guys. Hang in there, right? Mastering these takes some practice for you, and it takes some practice for your team. If your first one or two are a little awkward, which I guarantee you they will be, don't just be like, oh, well, we did two, but they sucked, and there was no point, and now we're bailing on them, right? 100%. It's going, it's, it's, it's like compound interest. It takes repetition. It takes time. And like any business skill, uh, practice makes, makes perfect. So, you know, if your first one sucked, 
your next one's going to be better. The one after that will be even better than that. And within a few months, you guys will be totally in the rhythm uh, and it's going to be working for you. So those are the four best practices we wanted to share. Igor, how, here's, a, here's a great question to kind of close on. If you do all this stuff, how do you know that they're working? Is there like, is there feedback? Is there stuff that you see within your team that tells you, hey, you know what? These, these team huddles, they are doing their job. Yeah, so one of the really big ones, just to, uh, just to start, is that you're going to start to see your team collaborating a whole lot more and very organically and naturally, right? So we talked about those links between people that are in charge of lead generation or marketing, that are in charge of s estimating and sales, of all the production management and day-to-day -day infield stuff, uh, all the office responsibilities. You're going to begin to see a whole lot more just very organic team collaboration because their personal relationships are stronger because mm. you're fostering that very intentionally and their working relationships are going to be stronger. Um, they're going to have a lot more fun with it. They're going to naturally collaborate and work together a lot more. The ramification of that, which is what I you know could call this second kind of big uh, win coming out of this is that your phone and your manager's phones should be ringing a whole lot less because they're going to be working on stuff throughout the week together. It no longer all funnels through you. They begin working together and collaborating, mm -hmm. right? Wouldn't that be nice? That would be amazing. And it does happen. And the other part of it is I think where, where it's super funny is to start to see people look forward to them. Again, if you've made it a priority and important to you and you'll, they'll see that through the quality of execution of it. And it'll be a, it'll be fun. It'll be something they look forward to. They're getting together. It's the one time of the month of the quarter of the week of the day whatever, when they all get to get together, we start off by celebrating wins and good fun stuff. We get updates from every department. They hear from different people. There's updates, main broadcasts from you as the leader of the whole show. Um, then they have time to hang out. It's just, it, it's a good time. It's, uh, uh, I remember when you were in elementary school and then the teacher rolls in the TV, like, <laughs> this is going to be great, right? So it, it's their time to chill and have a good time. Yeah. Cool. Right? So, um, I think, yeah, you, you got to have it fun though. You got to really have it fun. That's my big closing message is it's got to be a good time for you and them. And for it to be a good time, you got to put a better effort into, into orchestrating it. But that is your job as a leader. If you want to do your job, this is a part of it. Amazing. So six step process to follow and then four best practices, uh, take that run with it, implement it into your business and reap the rewards. Let's, let's leave it at that. Amazing. Hey, if you enjoyed this show, hit that subscribe button. It's what allows us to produce more awesome content for you totally for free.